Hello, my name is Will Kleber. Today, I will be talking about detection of malicious code using static taint analysis. This is a two-year project ending in October 2024. DOD uses a lot of software produced by various supply chains, which can be compromised by an adversary. Failing to detect malicious code can be very costly, but detection is difficult. For example, in the solar winds incident of 2020, there were 18,000 organizations who were infected with a piece of malicious code, of which 100 organizations were then targeted by the threat actor for further exploitation. This attack went on for months before it was detected. In this project, we aim to detect two different types of malicious code. First, exfiltration of sensitive data, and second, time bombs, logic bombs, remote access trojans, and so on. In general, we are looking for malicious code that calls a potentially sensitive system API function, such as starting a new process, in response to a potentially suspicious trigger. For example, if it does it on a specific hard-coded date, if it does it in response to an incoming network uh, packet from the attacker, and so forth. We are working with a DoD organization who's tasked with assuring the security of critical software. This is a very hard task because existing automated tools produce way too many false alarms and manual analysis is difficult, time consuming and expensive. Furthermore, there is a huge amount of software in use by DoD, so only the most critical of that software can be subject to a comprehensive analysis for malicious code. Our tool will flag code as being potentially malicious, but further human analysis will be required to, be, to determine whether that code is actually malicious or not. And the reason for this is that whether behavior is malicious or not depends on what the program is supposed to do. For example, if you have a video conferencing program, that program would be expected to read data from the system microphone and send it over the network. But if you have a spreadsheet program that does the same thing, well, that behavior would be highly suspicious in a spreadsheet program. Our tool will detect both intentionally inserted malicious code, as well as business logic vulnerabilities, such as the log for shell vulnerability in log4j. Our tool does not distinguish between these two types uh, of intentionally inserted versus accidental vulnerability. Because the, our code just looks for certain types of behaviors, it doesn't try to infer whether that behavior was inserted intentionally or accidentally. Language-based vulnerabilities, for example, buffer overflows, are outside of this project's focus because existing static analysis tools already do a very good job of detecting them. The goal for our tool is to produce output that concisely and precisely characterizes the potentially malicious behaviors of the code base so that a human analyst can quickly and accurately determine whether that behavior is benign or malicious. If successful, we expect that our tool will produce a level of assurance with respect to the applicable classes of malicious code with 10 to 100 times less manual effort than would be necessary with existing tools. In this project, we are using only static analysis, not dynamic analysis. So there is no need to actually run potentially malicious code. We are building on Phaser, which is an open source LLVM based static analysis framework, and it is available on GitHub. Initially, we are focusing on C and C++ code bases. We also have some support for binaries, and the way that we support binaries is by lifting the binary up to an LLVM intermediate representation, an IR. We can also fairly easily support other languages that also compile down to LLVM IR. For example, Rust is such a language. We have already developed a limited functionality preliminary version of the tool, and we expect to have developed a initial fully complete version of the tool around December. 
taint analysis using the interprocedural finite distributive subset algorithm, IFDS, has a successful track record, for example, of finding malicious flows of information in Android apps. With this approach, we say that sources are designated system API calls that return potentially sensitive information, and sinks are designated system API calls that can be used to exfiltrate data to outside the program. For example, sending information over a network socket, that would be considered sending information to a sink. So a limitation of traditional taint analysis is that it conflates together all flows from a given source to a given sink. This means that a malicious flow path can be hidden behind benign flow paths. Our idea in this project is to identify the conditions under which the flows happen, and especially to highlight the conditions that might be indicative of malicious code. Here is a motivating example. We see that there are two flows from the file system to the network. In flow one, I'm looking at line two of the uh, source code snippet now. We first um, read a command from the keyboard. Then we check to see if that command is an upload command. If it is, then we extract the file name that the user asks to upload. We read the contents of that file. And then we send that data to the network. This looks like a pretty benign flow. We only uh, sends file data over the network if the user specifically asks to do so. Now let's look at flow two. In flow two on line 11, we first read data from the network. We then call this command um, is special commands. And if that function returns true, then we read the contents of a file whose name is hardcoded, secrets.txt. Then we send that information to the network. So flow two looks obviously pretty suspicious. And um, in reality, you wouldn't have anything that looks quite this suspicious. But um, in, in general, it, by looking at uh, code, it's with a good level of analysis, it's usually pretty easy to determine whether it's malicious or not after you've already spent the time analyzing the code. So here we see an example of what I would consider ideal output from our tool. For flow one, it would indicate that the source is the file system and that the file name is specified by the user. It would indicate that the sync is the network. And if there's a, a hard-coded IP address and port number, it would give those. And it would also indicate the condition under which the flow happens. In this case, it would say that the condition is that a user input satisfies the function is upload command on line three. Also, we will recursively analyze that function is upload command to see if there are any suspicious conditionals in that quality chain. In this case, we would find no suspicious conditionals. For flow two, we again report that the source is the file system. We, re we report the hard-coded file name. And we report information about the sync. For the condition, again, we say that it happens if um, if data satisfies a search and function, and we also identify that uh, that data came from the network. Now, in this case, perhaps that function is special commands. Maybe it uses some cryptographic hash functions to check um, whether the data really is this uh, special command that it is intended to trigger on. And in that case, for things like that, we would identify that uh, the condition involves cryptographic operations or other um, features that might be indicative of malware. Now, currently, our tool is not quite at the stage of, that I mentioned on this previous slide. Currently, our tool provides a more limited output. So currently, its output is a list of tuples of the form source, sync, and conditional edge. Here, conditional edge is the outgoing edge in the control flow graph of a conditional jump. And the tuple source sync conditional edge, that indicates that there is a flow path from the source to the sink that depends on the specified conditional edge. So let's take a look at the example. In the example box in the middle of the slide, we see, we see that um, we see a tuple whose source is a read from file, and uh, that corresponds to um, <clears throat> line 5 on the uh, example E1 box on the far right-hand side of the slide. The sink sent to network. That is line six. 
Then we give the conditional edge. The conditional edge is from line three, which is the if statement, if is upload command. And the target of that is line four. So this conditional edge is taking if the conditional expression of the if statement, if that evaluates to true. The next tuple in our example output is again from the source of read from file to the sync sent to network. And in this case, the conditional edge is from line 12, if is special command to line 13. And again, this is the conditional edge that is taken if the conditional expression of the if statement evaluates to true. So if a flow path depends on multiple conditionals, then the output will include a tuple for each one of those conditionals. And if a flow path happens unconditionally, then we just use a dummy value for the conditional edge fields. There are also um, some sensitive operations that we detect that do not involve a source to sync flow. And in that case, we just leave the source fields blank. And for the sync fields, we uh, put in the sensitive API call. So this diagram shows how our, how our uh, current tool operates. We take three inputs. The source code, C or C++ builds up world by calling, or we can also take LLVMIR directly. If we do get um, source code as opposed to LLVMIR, then we need to build that into LLVMIR. So we need to take a builds command that tells us how to do that. As our third input, we take a list of sensitive sources, sensitive sinks, and sensitive operations. So we supply a default list with our tool, and that list is also easily uh, user-editable. Uh, user we also plan to work with binaries in FY24, and the way that we plan to do that is by lifting the binaries to LLVM IR using a lifter that Jeff Gennari is developing here at the Software Engineering Institute. So our current tool capability, its output, as I mentioned on uh, two slides ago, its output is a uh, set of tuples of the form source, sync, and conditional edge. Now that output is not um, really very readily uh, human understandable. It, you need to go and dig through the source code to, um, to be able to use that code. So what we want to do, um, what we're, in fact, what we are working on right now is to add additional capabilities to the tool to concisely and precisely characterize the behavior of the code base. So rather than just reporting that list of tuples, we would pro uh, provide something more uh, human-friendly that, um, more th that uh, takes less time to uh, manually adjudicate. And we will also provide functionality for filtering out um, obvious false positives. So here we see an example of a running our tool on a toy example. Uh, we see that it finds a flow from the source f read to the sync write. And it gives a list of involved conditional edges. Now, looking at this list, you can see that a lot of these conditions are actually just error checking. For example, it checks to see if there's a connect error it checks to see if uh, user input length is negative one, which indicates an error condition. So those are all noise. We want to filter those out. So one of the things that we're working on now is to identify obvious false positives, things that are not um, very indicative of malicious code, and just filter those out so that we can highlight the conditionals that actually are potentially indicative of malicious code. So in that uh, example on the previous slide, the system API call write is listed as a sync. Now this function can be used to write to both network sockets as well as to regular files, depending on the function's first argument, the file descriptor. So we don't want to just say that there's a flow to this write function, because you don't know then whether it's going to the file system or to the network. So to make that distinction, what we are going to do is to do an auxiliary information flow analysis to trace the origin of that file descriptor back to either a, uh, an API call that opens a regular file or an API call that opens a network socket. And then we will be able to report that this is a write to the network or a write to the local file system. 
So in terms of next steps for this project, first, the one that we're working on now is of that auxiliary data flow analysis. And additionally, besides what I described in the previous slide, we are also going to provide information about the file path. For example, if there is a hard-coded file name, we would report that. If um, the file is confined to a particular um, directory, we can report that. If uh, there is a whitelist of um, good extensions that can be used, we can report that. For example, um, a lot of malware um, creates uh, certain sensitive types of files on the computer. For example, it might create a .dll file, which can then be loaded to overwrite functions that are used by other applications. So we want to provide as much of that information as possible to make the manual adjudication as easy as possible. We are also expanding our default list of sensitive sources and syncs. Now, the Windows API contains a vast number of functions. So in order to make this more practical, we are using a large language model, such as uh, GPT-4, in order to identify um, likely sources and syncs within the Windows API. And, we, and in order to um, ensure accuracy, we are also um, manually auditing those results. And as necessary, we are doing some prompt engineering to get more accurate results from the large language model. Also, we are working to identify features of conditionals that are indicative of time bombs and logic bombs. And we are basing this on the uh, trigger scope paper by Yannick et al. We're also working to, iter to iteratively re refine the tool to ease the manual burden of reviewing the results. And the way that we are doing that is that we're going to run the tool on a code base, manually adjudicate um, whether behaviors are malicious or benign. And as we do that, we're going to record difficulties that we encounter. Like maybe the tool doesn't provide enough information that we need, and we have to manually inspect the code base to find it, or maybe there's like a class of really noisy results that we want to filter out. So we're going to record what we need to do to make the, um, to make the, the tool's output more useful. And then we're going to implement those improvements and repeat that process. So we're working on that now. And we expect to have that ready by around probably the end of December or so. And after that's done, after we have our tool in a good state, we are going to ask our um, engaged DOD partner organization to evaluate the tool and provide us with further feedback. And based on our feedback, we can make further improvements to the tool and also make it better, work better with their system. Maybe they find that there's um, some feature of the tool that would make it um, integrate better with their existing tools, and we can work on providing that. Also, we are working to improve uh, support for decompiled or lifted binaries. We are also looking for additional interested parties to help us evaluate the tool and to, evaluate, to validate its effort savings. If you are interested in trying out our tool once it's ready, which will be around December, we expect, um, or if you'd like to suggest features that you find uh, particularly useful, please contact us at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you for your time.